In our previous studies on this channel, we have seen that the little horn in Daniel 7 undoubtedly refers to the papacy. It's important to note this doesn't reference the people who attend churches led by the papacy, but the institution of the Roman church which has been around for a very long time. This is not a new idea at all. In fact, some of the most illustrious scholars in Protestantism agree on the identity of this little horn. Martin Luther of the Lutheran Church, John Calvin and John Knox of the Presbyterian Church, Adam Clark of the Methodist Church, Roger Williams of the Baptist Church, without exception, understood this little horn to reference the papacy. Other great scholars besides theologians came to the same conclusion. Sir Isaac Newton stated the same conclusion in his book Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and of the Apocalypse of St. John. England's King James I, who sponsored the King James Bible, also identified the papacy as the little horn power. Just like in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7, the image and the beasts were the same in a different illustration, so the little horn is the same in Scripture as a beast described in Revelation, where we get more details. We will study this in upcoming videos on this channel. Now, back to this time prophecy. In Daniel 7, we see this little horn subdues three kings, which are the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. It speaks pompous words against the Most High. So it's a part of a religious and part political power, and it also persecutes the saints of the Most High, which we see in the Inquisition of the Church of Rome. This is easy history to identify. It shall intend to change times and law, which we saw in the last video on this channel, is the Sabbath, the only part of the law that involves time. Then it says in verse 25, Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Okay, what does this mean? The little horn power would persecute the saints for a certain amount of time. Did this happen, and how long did it happen for? That's what God is trying to explain to Daniel, and we can look at it from a historical point of view to verify it. First, what does time, times, and half a time mean? In Daniel 4, we read of seven times referring to seven years when King Nebuchadnezzar was driven to dwell with the beasts of the field. The King James Bible says times, but many modern translations say years instead, either in a footnote or in the actual text. A time was an ancient way of expressing a year. So here's where we figure this out. A time is one year, times is two years, and a half a time is six months. The NIV translation says, for a year, two years, and half a year. The Living Bible and today's English version say three and a half years. So the conclusion of a three and a half year period is very common. It's important to note here that ancient calendars used 360 days in their yearly calendar, or 12 months with 30 days in each. This is true of the Egyptian, Assyrian, and Hebrew calendars. So with three and a half years of 360-day calendars, we come to 1,260 days. In symbolic prophecy, each prophetic day stands for an actual year. In Numbers 14.34, we read, each day for a year, applying 40 days for 40 years. Again, in Ezekiel 4.6, God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So we can understand that this time period of 1,260 prophetic days actually equals 1,260 prophetic years, which according to the message God gave Daniel means the little horn, or papacy, will have a period of 1,260 years of persecuting the saints. In Revelation 12, 6, we see these same numbers in a mirrored prophecy regarding a beast, where it says, The woman fled into the wilderness 1,203 score days. During the Dark Ages, while the Bible was virtually a closed book, God's church had to flee persecution and go underground for a period of 1,260 prophetic days or 1,260 literal years. In the Bible, a woman represents a church. We see this in multiple places, and here it represents a faithful church. In Revelation 12, 14, we see the same term as we saw in Daniel of time, times, and half a time, where the woman, or faithful church, had a period of persecution. In Revelation 13, 5, it says, And power was given to him, the beast, to continue for 42 months. At 30 days a month, again, the time equals precisely 1,260 days, or literal years. Pretty awesome how it all connects together, right? What we can conclude is that the little horn power is the same as the beast power in Revelation. So, is all this accurate? Did the papacy have power and persecute Bible believers for 1,260 years? Well, we know for sure that the Church of Rome persecuted people that disagreed with their teachings. 
We see concrete evidence of this in history. But what about this time prophecy? Once again, God knows what will happen even before it happens down to the last detail. The precision of the fulfillment of this prophecy will blow your mind and build your faith in an all-knowing God. We see this little horn power in Daniel, the papacy, gain huge control of Europe in the year 538 AD. Emperor Justinian issued an imperial letter elevating the Bishop of Rome to be the head of all the holy churches in 533 AD. But there were problems with actually implementing this. Remember those three kingdoms that the papacy had to overcome? Well, there was one left ruling in Italy, the Ostrogoths. Justinian sent his armies under General Belisarius and drove the Ostrogoths out of Rome in March of 538 AD, giving control to the Roman pontiff to exercise his jurisdiction. This is what we see as the feat in Daniel 2 where the dominance of Rome changes form but is still a player on the global level. The legs were of iron representing Rome, but the feet were of iron and clay. The iron was different in form as a religious and political power. So we have an identity on this little horn power as the papacy, and now we have a start date for their beginning as a leading power, 538 AD. If there's truth in this prophecy, we should be able to add 1,260 years to this and find an end of the role of the papacy as a leading power in the world. If we add 1,260 years to 538, it brings us to the year 1798. That's not that long ago. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte's general Berthier entered Rome and took the current pope captive. The pontiff was dethroned, imprisoned, and exiled in France, where he soon died. God's detailed prophecy to Daniel all those years ago kept perfect time and ended just as God said it would. Justinian's decree in 533, implemented in 538 with the overthrow of the Ostrogoths, shaped history. Exactly 1,260 years later, the armies of Napoleon ended his prophecy with the capture and death of the Pope, ending dominance and religious persecution of the Dark Ages. Theologian David Simpson, who lived during the time of these ground-shaking events in the late 1700s, wrote this as an eyewitness to the arrest of the Roman pontiff. Is it not extremely remarkable and a powerful confirmation of the truth of Scripture prophecy that just 1,260 years ago from the present 1798, in the very beginning of the year 538, Belisarius put an end to the empire of the Goths at Rome, leaving no power therein but the bishop of that metropolis? Read these things in the prophetic scriptures, compare them coolly with the present state of Europe, and then I say again, deny the truth of divine revelation if you can. Open your eyes and behold these things accomplishing in the face of the whole world. This thing was not done in a corner. The fulfillment of this prophecy was done for the whole world to see and in the exact time that God predicted to Daniel all those years ago in a dream. Now you might say, hey, there's a Pope today. How does that fit in with the end of this prophecy? And that's a great question. The Bible explains this. You remember how the little horn and the beast power and revelation were the same? They had the same 1260 year period, both persecuted the saints. The Bible says in Revelation 13.3 and 13.12 that the beast or little horn power would receive a deadly wound, referencing an end to their power in 1798, like we have seen. It would appear that this was the end of the papacy. After that pope's death in France, no new pope replaced him. However, later in Revelation 13.3, it says the deadly wound would be healed and the world would wander after this beast. It echoes this in Revelation 13, 12, saying the deadly wound to the beast would be healed. In Revelation 13, 14, it says the beast which had the wound by the sword did live. So we should see a reappearance of the papacy sometime after 1798. It would look like the papal power was gone forever, but it would make a comeback. Did this happen? Just a few years later, negotiations started to happen to reinstate a papal position. On March 14, 1800, Barnabas Caramonti took the name Pius VII and assumed the position of Pope, with many negotiations with France and Napoleon. The Pope had to agree to waive former claims and renounce certain properties, among other concessions. Oddly enough, Napoleon was instrumental in inflicting the wound to the beast and affecting its healing. The papacy was back, in a much weaker position, but it was back nonetheless. In 1929, a concordat was signed by Benito Mussolini, the premier of Italy, and Cardinal Gaspari, which made the pope one of the sovereigns of the earth again. 
The headline from the San Francisco Chronicle on Tuesday, February 12, 1929, was carried over the wires of the Associated Press and went to every major news outlet. And it said this in the headline, Mussolini and Gaspari sign historic Roman pact, heal wound of many years. Notice the exact biblical wording of healing a wound? The article went on to say, in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound which has festered since 1870, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. This concordat, often called the Lateran Treaty, gave the Pope sovereign status as ruler over Vatican City and a financial clause that compensated the papacy with two billion in cash and stock for church properties seized in 1870. The papacy is bouncing back and that wound is healing. In 1929, only 14 nations had representatives at the Vatican, but today, most countries in the world have an ambassadorial representative at Vatican City. The only religious and political power on earth to have political representatives. Truly, the feet of the statue in Daniel 2 shows that a Roman power, different in form from the political Rome in the old days, would have a major political and religious influence all the way down to the end of time. In the next few videos, we are going to study more what the book of Revelation says about this little horn and beast power in regards to the last days as the angel Gabriel explained to Daniel. With a track record of persecution and changing God's law, along with what the scripture describes as blasphemy, we have to know what to expect in the future from this little horn and beast power. The Bible describes a mark associated with this beast. It also has important messages from three angels regarding the time of the end, and we will be studying these fascinating topics in upcoming videos. If God thought these details were important enough to send to Daniel and John in visions and dreams about the time of the end which we are living in right now, I want to know the truth about these prophecies so I can be prepared with the right information to remain faithful to Jesus to the end. Thanks for watching, and I want to invite you to continue to study with me on this channel to find out what God is saying through His prophecies in Scripture. Together, let's find out what the truth is. God bless you as you continue to study. I'm Jamie Houghton with 832. Be sure and subscribe so you don't miss any more of our Bible studies as we continue to look at end time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Thanks so much for watching.